In the summer of 1880, to the dismay of local residents, Dr. Koch left the small town of Wolstein for Berlin. Thanks to his work on anthrax, the young doctor had been noticed and was offered a bacteriology laboratory with the title of government advisor. This man, who had always worked alone, would now be surrounded by the best in his field. Monsieur. Bonjour, Dr. Dr. Koch. Koch had a new goal. After anthrax, he wanted to understand the origins of specifically human diseases. But to become a microbe hunter, he would have to improve his techniques. This was when he developed a key innovation for microbiology, culture in a solid medium. Until now, cultures had been grown in liquid environments. When dealing with only one sort of bacteria, such as in sheep's blood infected with anthrax, it was easy to cultivate. But when there were several kinds of bacteria, it was much more difficult to isolate them. The doctor's first breakthrough involved growing bacteria on potatoes. But this method did not work for the microbes he was interested in, those which could transmit disease. Monsieur, venez voir, s'il vous plaît. After numerous trials, he finally found the perfect medium. Et donc vous avez utilisé de la gélatine, tout simplement. De la gélatine. Et nous pourrions ainsi cultiver n'importe quelle bactérie. Je le pense, oui. His discovery was revolutionary. This new technique meant that identifying microbes took on a whole new dimension. Ah. Monsieur Pasteur. While the German doctor honed his techniques, the Frenchman was preparing a coup of his own. Et vous êtes Tulier, assistant de Monsieur Pasteur. Bien, tout est prêt, Monsieur Rossignol. Nous avons suivi vos dernières instructions à la lettre. Allons-y, alors. Suivez-moi. Allons, allons, écartez-vous. On May 5, 1881, Pasteur set out to perform a public experiment on anthrax vaccination. The principle of vaccination had been understood since the end of the 18th century. An English physician, Edward Jenner, had demonstrated that subjects could be protected from smallpox, a very dangerous sickness, by injecting them with pus containing the bacteria of a related but less serious illness, cowpox. Although Jenner had invented vaccination, he didn't know why it worked. Pasteur thought he had found the answer. Smallpox was certainly caused by a microbe, and the vaccine must be a milder form of the same microbe. He had already achieved some results with anthrax when a vet, Mr. Rossignol, challenged him to make a public demonstration. J'espère que vous savez ce que vous faites, Monsieur Pasteur. Nous sacrifions une cinquantaine de moutons. Uh, non, Monsieur Rossignol, vous n'en sacrifiez que la moitié. L'autre moitié sera vaccinée et sauvée par la vaccination. Nous verrons bien. Roux, tuilier, où en êtes-vous Nous sommes prêts, Monsieur Pasteur. On May 5th, Pasteur's team carried out the first ever public vaccination program involving 50 sheep. Twenty-five of them were given a first injection of attenuated anthrax, intended to protect them. For the next month, the public flocked to the farm to observe their behavior. But the public were mainly interested in the second injection, when full-blown anthrax would be introduced to all 50 sheep, those vaccinated and those unprotected. The experiment at Pouilly-le-Fort was an incredible gamble. No one would ever repeat an experiment like that in front of the press and the public. He vaccinated the animals. He could easily have destroyed his reputation because experiments like that can go wrong in many ways. He did it anyway. Vous avez dû vous tromper dans une injection, ou ce n'est pas possible autrement. Monsieur, je vous assure, j'ai respecté absolument... Vous ne vous rendez pas compte Une brebis qui meurt, et c'est toute l'expérience qui va être mise en cause. Je ne parle pas de ma réputation. Calme-toi, Louis. 
Il n'y en a qu'une seule, c'est peut-être autre chose. Autre chose Mais Même si c'était vrai, personne ne le croira. Est-ce que tu es sûr que la brebis est morte Elle va peut-être s'en sortir. Elle était mourante hier soir, alors qu'il est. Monsieur, même ainsi, ça reste un taux de réussite exceptionnel. Mais vous raisonnez comme un scientifique, Roux. Vous croyez que les gens sont prêts à jouer leur vie à la loterie Non. Ou ça marche, ou ça ne marche pas. C'est un nouveau télégramme de Melun. C'est Rossignol. La brebis s'est remise. Ah, alors bah Tu vois bien. On a réussi, monsieur Pasteur. Évidemment qu'on a réussi. Vous êtes toujours à douter, vous. Hein Two months later, Pasteur was invited to the International Medical Congress in London. In the wake of his success at puy le fort Pasteur's appearance was a triumph. Dear Marie, 3,000 members of the Congress gathered. People packed in, a variety of speeches, only one name mentioned, mine, followed by an ovation. I was bursting with pride inside at the thought of being exceptionally distinguished in the midst of this vast gathering of foreigners, especially Germans, who are here in considerable numbers. Among this German contingent, Pasteur certainly didn't notice the humble doctor who had so irritated him with his article. Koch was not part of the elite. He watched Pasteur's appearance as a simple spectator. Koch was expecting the celebrated chemist to acknowledge his work on anthrax. But Pasteur made no mention of him. Koch was very upset. After three years of laborious work while still practicing as a doctor, he had made a full study of the disease, and he thought that this at least deserved to be mentioned. Koch was seething and was planning to leave London without meeting Pasteur when the English surgeon Joseph Lister stepped in. Lister had organized the Congress and was a great admirer of Pasteur. He was also very impressed by Koch's recent discoveries with growing cultures in a solid medium. He invited Pasteur to attend a demonstration. Lister arranges to have them both in his laboratory. Koch gives a demonstration of his new techniques, and Pasteur is quite surprised. Pasteur was won over and ended up admitting, this is a great step forward, sir. So Pasteur paid a compliment to Koch, and after that, one might imagine that everything was fine between Pasteur and Koch. Pasteur cannot isolate the anthrax bacillus. Pasteur's experiment is of no value. It even smacks of naivety. Robert, il est vraiment tard, tu sais. Oui, je sais, je sais. His work has led to confusion on many questions that had already been resolved or were about to be. Tu écris depuis ce matin. Emile, laisse-moi tranquille. Viens te coucher. <laughs> as soon as he was back from London, Koch wrote an article attacking Pasteur's work. Stung by his rebuke, he did what Pasteur had never done. He took on a human disease. He chose the deadliest of the day, tuberculosis. In the age of industrialization, the sickness was widespread in insalubrious neighborhoods. In cities, it killed one adult in three. In certain working districts, it wiped out 60% of children. But where did it come from? Most doctors thought it was hereditary. Koch did not agree and went in search of the microbe. It was a tricky task. These were tiny organisms that grew very slowly and which were difficult to spot, even under the microscope. But Koch was sure he was on the right track. He developed a coloring technique to identify the bacteria. 
patiently, day after day, over many months, he closed in on the suspects. On March 24, 1882, Koch summoned his most eminent colleagues. My dear colleagues, if I were to have you here today, it's to evoke a subject on which I've been working for several months. He only told them he would be discussing tuberculosis. La tuberculose est une maladie bien plus dangereuse que la peste qui provoque des ravages. The participants mainly came out of curiosity, but they soon realized they were witnessing an historic moment. L'éventualité d'une bactérie longue comme un. In his usual matter-of-fact manner, Robert Koch told them how he had succeeded in identifying the tuberculosis bacteria. Il peut être affirmé que les bacilles sont donc la cause de la tuberculose. The assistants were stunned. Messieurs, je vous remercie. Tuberculosis had been known since antiquity. Koch had started work on it seven months previously. This was incredibly fast to identify one of the most dangerous bacteria known to mankind. A few days after their initial publication, his findings were reported in the international press. The tuberculosis bacteria would soon be known simply as Koch bacillus. A year after the London Congress, Koch was buoyed with new confidence when he attended the International Hygiene Congress in Geneva. This time, there would not be just one star as in London, but two. And this time, the Frenchman and the German were not arriving on the same terms. There had been no exchange between them since Koch's harsh criticism in the wake of the London Congress. Robert Koch arrived proudly, thanks to his discovery of the tuberculosis bacillus, while Pasteur was plotting his revenge, having since read Koch's response to his presentation in London. He had already drafted a speech to demolish Koch's critique. Pasteur stayed in the Hotel des Bergues on the shores of Lake Geneva. For once, he was accompanied by his wife, Marie, who had carefully crafted his speech, along with his young assistant, Louis Trillier. On the morning of the 5th of September, he spotted Koch, who was staying in the same hotel. They bid one another a silent greeting. Pasteur was saving himself for the Congress. Gentlemen, the committee of this Congress... At 2 p.m., in the hall of the university, Pasteur took to the podium and was met with an ovation. Koch was seated in the front row. Pasteur began his speech in Geneva, describing his work on vaccination against fowl cholera, anthrax, and so on. His speech was quite short. Then all of a sudden, he veered off and attacked Robert Koch. I have encountered, both in France and abroad, some fierce detractors. Permit me to single out among them he whose personal merits most deserves our attention. I'd like to talk about Dr. Koch of Berlin. And he totally ridiculed the arguments that Koch had put forward in his article, and also those put forward by his colleagues. Suddenly, Koch grew angry. He seemed utterly appalled, and he tried to interrupt Pasteur. To sum up, not one of the criticisms leveled by Koch and his pupils stands up. All they did was underline the mistakes and inexperience of their authors. Koch got up on stage. The audience held its breath. But despite his frustration, Koch declined to debate. I don't believe there is any point responding to attacks here. Since I do not speak French and Mr. Pasteur does not speak German, we cannot engage in a meaningful discussion. I reserve the right to respond to Mr. Pasteur through the medical journals. Pasteur was a great orator, whereas Koch was no such thing. 
He wasn't a charismatic speaker. He certainly would not have been able to match Pasteur in a battle of oration. My dear Roux, I won't tell you about Geneva. Tullier can do that. Everything went well. Koch was greatly ridiculed, quite besmirched. The two scholars left Geneva without speaking to one another. It was the second time they had met. It would be the last. On the subject of anthrax, everything we heard amounted to results of no interest whatsoever. I brought no new scientific elements? Really, sir? Pasteur is happy to trot out generalities, which naturally change nothing for the topic itself. Pasteur is not even a doctor. You hadn't even cut your teeth in science when I was concentrating on isolating and growing microbes in a pure state. A fresh epidemic gave them the first opportunity for a confrontation in the field. In the summer of 1883, cholera threatened Europe. The outbreak began in Egypt. The whole Nile Delta was infected, the disease killing some 500 people a day. France, as the colonial power, had to play a leading role. A mission was set up in Alexandria on the 15th of August. Now aged 60, Pasteur did not join the trip. He put the mission in the hands of his disciple, Emile Roux. On the other side of the Rhine, the German government entrusted Koch with a similar task. The German led his delegation in person when they arrived in Alexandria on the 24th of August. Dear Emmy, I arrived here yesterday. It is hot but bearable. I went to bed after midnight, and we were at work at 5 a.m. Nous en avons trouvé un qui est mort ce matin. Et vous êtes sûr que c'est le choléra, Gavki? Absolument. The epidemic will not last much longer. Fortunately, we quickly found someone who had died of cholera to begin our analysis. C'est bien. Faites-le transporter en salle d'autopsie, Gavki. So far, we are all in good health. May that continue. Oui, c'est une nouvelle lettre d'Égypte. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? C'est tu lié? Lié. Mon Dieu. Il fut gai toute la journée, et à trois heures du matin, il se sent très mal et entre dans la chambre en criant « Roux, je me sens très mal ». Et il tombe sur le plancher. Nous avons cru à une indigestion à 8 heures du matin. On peut le considérer comme mort. This was a total disaster for him. He blamed himself and felt guilty. That said, he had given them a whole host of instructions not to take any risks. Despite that, poor Tuilier, who he held very dear and who was a gifted and brilliant student with much promise, died at the age of 26. Mr. Koch and his team came over as soon as the news spread across town. They found the most touching words for the memory of our dearly departed. This was quite a surprising episode in the relationship between Koch and Pasteur. The death of Tuilier created a sort of truce in their confrontation. These gentlemen brought two reeds that they themselves nailed to the coffin. They are modest, said Mr. Koch, but they are made of laurel like those given to the glorious. <laughs> 